Hello everyone. I'm here to discuss the most relevant current affairs of today from UPSC point of view. Before I begin, I would request you to subscribe to my channel and never miss any update. So without a further ado, let's begin. Our first article is about the Pinaki rocket system. DRDO recently test fired this indigenously developed rocket from MBRL that is multi barrel rocket system stationed in Chandipur off the coast of Odisha the missile is aided by the navigation system developed in India that is Indian Regional Navigation Satellite System IRNSS so IRNSS is an independent regional navigation satellite system developed by India it is being designed to give precise position data service to users located in India and also to users in the area outspreading up to 1500 kilometers from India's boundary. IRNSS is India's own GPS like system, much like the American GPS system. The difference between both is that while IRNSS is a regional satellite navigation system, the American GPS is a global satellite navigation system. The IRNSS aims to provide the following services. First, a standard positioning service for civilian, research and commercial use and secondly, restricted services for authorized users, for example the defense. So Navic is basically the commercial name for IRNSS system. It was developed in India by ISRO and its commercial wing Antrix. The next article is about the use of LIDAR technology by the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change to boost the groundwater in forest areas. So recently, the Minister of Environment, Forest and Climate Change in a virtual event released the detailed project reports of LIDAR-based survey of forest areas in 10 states, namely Assam, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Goa, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Manipur, Nagaland and Tripura. It will help to reduce human-animal conflict, help in groundwater recharge and also help the local communities. The Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change also asked the state departments to use CAMPA funds towards implementation of these projects. Let us have a quick look at the CAMPA. So the CAMPA Act or Compensatory Afforestation Fund Act of 2016 is an Indian legislation that seeks to provide an appropriate institutional mechanism both at the centre as well as the state and union territory levels to ensure expeditious utilisation of efficient and transparent manner of amounts released in lieu of forest land diverted for non-forest purpose which would mitigate impact of diversion of such land. So basically, whenever a forest land is being used for non-forest purposes, a fund has to be set aside which is called the Camper Fund for afforestation. The WAPCOS has prepared these DPRs using the LIDAR technology which employs 3D it will be used for recommending different types of soil and water conservation structures such as anicut, gabion, gully plug, etc. These structures will help in catching the rainwater and preventing stream runoff which will help in recharging of groundwater. Let us have a look at the LIDAR technology. So LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging which is a remote sensing method that uses light in the form of pulsed laser to measure ranges to the earth. These light pulses combined with other data recorded by the airborne system generate precise three-dimensional information about the shape of the earth and its surface characteristics. Let us look at how it works. A LIDAR instrument principally consists of a laser, a scanner and a specialized GPS receiver. Airplanes and helicopters are the most commonly used platforms for acquiring LIDAR data over broad areas. LIDAR follows a simple principle. Throw laser light at an object on the Earth's surface and calculate the time it takes to return to the LIDAR source. Let's have a look at a diagram to make it more clear. So you can see the inertial navigation system which records the precise orientation of the scanner. The laser scanner emits the infrared laser pulses then captures and records the return pulses that are reflected from the surface of the earth objects. Then the GPS gives the precise location of the scanner. The use of LIDAR was in news last year 
when archaeologists in UK used it to study Tamar Valley. Tamar Valley is a world heritage site. Let us have a look at the applications of LIDAR apart from the one that we have read. So it can be used in agriculture for the analysis of yield rates, crop scouting and seed dispersion. It may also be used for mapping under forest canopies, campaign planning, etc. LIDAR can be used for rescue missions. When the authorities want to know the exact depth of the ocean surface to locate any object in case of a maritime accident or research purposes. LIDAR is also used in oceanography to map the land and to use it to measure the seafloor and riverbed elevations. LIDAR technology basically uses a 3D model to represent elevations and contours. The next article says that India's term as the chairperson of ILO has come to an end and now the chairmanship has gone to Sweden. In the light of this article, let us take a look at the history of ILO. The International Labour Organization, which is based in Geneva, Switzerland, was established in 1919 by the Treaty of Versailles as an affiliated agency of the League of Nations. It became the first affiliated specialized agency of the United Nations in 1946. The ILO promotes internationally recognized human and labour rights. It also received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1969 for improving peace among classes, pursuing decent work and justice for workers and providing technical assistance to other developing nations. Today, it is providing substantial support in the building of an ethical and productive framework for fair globalization. So the ILO basically consists of International Labour Conference, the Governing Body and the International Labour Office. The International Labour Conference is also known as the International Parliament of Labour. It sets the international labour standards and the broad policies of the ILO. It meets annually in Geneva. The governing body is the Executive Council of the ILO. It meets three times a year in Geneva. The International Labour Office is the permanent secretariat of the ILO. It is the focal point for ILO's overall activities, which it prepares under the scrutiny of the governing body and the leadership of the Director General of ILO. Also, there are certain regional meetings of the ILO member states which are held periodically to examine the matters of a special interest to the regions concerned. Let us look at another important point which is the ILO Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work. It was adopted in 1998. The declaration commits member states to respect and promote eight fundamental principles and rights, which have been categorized into four types and the member countries have to follow it whether or not they have ratified the relevant conventions. They are freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining under the conventions 87 and 98, elimination of forced or compulsory labor under the Conventions 29 and 105, abolition of child labour under the Convention 138 and 182, and elimination of discrimination in respect of employment and occupation, Conventions 100 and 111. One must remember that the Convention number 138 and number 182 have been adopted by all parties of the ILO. Also, the Sustainable Development Goal aims at complete abolition of child labour by 2025. Let us have a look at this UPSC previous year question from prelims 2018 related to the ILO. The question says, the International Labour Organization's Conventions 138 and 182 are related to which of the following? So the correct answer is child labour. The next news is that Pakistan has continued to stay on the FATF's grey list. Let us read about FATF. The Financial Action Task Force is an intergovernmental body established in 1989 during the G7 summit in Paris. Its objectives are to set a standard and promote effective implementation of legal, regulatory and operational measures for combating money laundering, terrorist financing and other related threats to the integrity of the international financial system. Its secretariat is located at the OECD headquarter in Paris.
there are currently 37 members in its jurisdiction. India is also one of the members. FATF basically has two lists, the grey list and the black list. Grey list includes countries that are considered safe haven for supporting terror funding and money laundering. This inclusion serves as a warning to the country that it may be blacklisted. Blacklisted countries are also known as non-cooperative countries or territories. They are put in the blacklist for supporting terror funding and money laundering activities. The FATF regularly revises the blacklists and the grey list. The FATF plenary meeting is the decision-making body of the FATF. It means three times a year. Is India a member of FATF? Yes. Another notable organizational members of FATF are the World Bank, the IMF, the Asian Development Bank, the BCBS or the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, the United Nations, as well as the World Customs Organization. Are all countries which are members of the Gulf Cooperation Council also the members of FATF? So the answer is, although the Gulf Cooperation Council is a full member of the FATF, the individual member countries of the GCC, that is Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are not. The next article is a report on a study that links air pollution to COVID-19. A first of its kind pan-India study says that Mumbai and Pune are among hotspots where high air pollution from the transport and industrial sectors is related to a high number of COVID cases and deaths. The article says that Maharashtra recorded the second highest emission level of PM2.5 after Uttar Pradesh. Let us look at PM2.5 particles. So PM2.5 refers to particles that have diameter less than 2.5 micrometers and remain suspended or longer. These particles are formed as a result of burning fuel and chemical reactions that take place in the atmosphere. Natural processes such as forest fires also contribute to PM2.5 in the air. These particles are also the primary reason for the occurrence of smog. In January 2021, an IIT Delhi study linked the PM2.5 presence to the rising cases of anemia in children under the age of 5 years. The next article talks about dowry cases in Kerala in particular and the entailing crime. The author argues that Kerala is always top of the Niti Aayog indices on various parameters. It also has the highest literacy rate of females that is approximately 95% and also a better sex ratio compared to other states. The Kudumba Shri, which is a women collective of Kerala, is a model of women empowerment. Even in the COVID times, various women health workers, Asha and Anganwari workers were the frontline volunteers. Yet the NCRB or the National Crime Record Bureau's data cites that approximately 2,700 cases against women were registered in 2020 related to dowry directly or indirectly. So in the light of this article, let us have a look at the issues of dowry in India. So dowry deaths account for 40-50% to 50 homicides in the country for almost a decade from 1999 to 2018. In 2019 alone, 7,115 cases of dowry deaths were registered under the Section 304B of the Indian Penal Code. Let us read about the Dowry Prohibition Act of 1961. The term dowry has not been defined in IPC. According to the Act, it has been defined as any property or valuable security given or agreed to be given directly or indirectly. There are certain conditions for it also. However, customary payments, as are prevalent in different societies, such as at the time of birth of a child, etc., are not covered within the dowry. Also, giving and taking dowry, both are offences. Let us have a look at certain additional laws related to dowry. So, in addition to the Dowry Prohibition Act of 1961, the laws have been made more stringent, namely, Section 304B, that is Dowry Death, and Section 498A, Cruelty by Husband or His Relatives which have been integrated in the Indian Penal Code. The other one is the Section 113b, which is the presumption as to dowry death, has been made a part of the Indian Evidence Act, so as to eradicate or at least lower down this heinous act of dowry system and related deaths. 
the next article talks about how shutting of national parks helps tigers. So the article states that the Jim Corbett National Park and the Rajaji National Park of Uttarakhand will remain open round the year. Until now, they remain closed during the 4 to 5 months period in monsoon. Now a debate has arisen whether tourism activities during the monsoon will disturb the tigers in the mating season. The article mentions that contrary to the myth, tigers breed round the year. In India, there is a seasonal bias, but it is towards the autumn and spring window. The article further says that the rainy season is not the best time for tiger breeding, so all the apprehensions about the threat to tiger breeding due to the opening of the national parks in the monsoon is not very logical. Although the article mentions that elephant breeding is indeed linked to rainfall patterns. So basically, national parks are closed during the monsoon since the national park and tropical regions become inaccessible. The lush undergrowths block the paths and the gullies wash away the tracks, making it inaccessible for people. The article cites the example of the Nagarhole and Bandipur Tiger Reserves in Karnataka, which are closed during summer to protect animals from stress and forest fire. While in the northern part of the country, rainy seasons are quite challenging and hence the national parks are closed for the convenience of the tourists. In the northern part of the country during the monsoons, seasonal nalas carry boulders and wash away the roads. The article further says that investment in mega machines and other technologies can enable opening of the national parks all the year round. The article mentions certain international cases like the Yellowstone, which is the first national park of the US, which remains shut every winter during the snow season. The same holds true for national parks in Russia as well as the Arctic countries. Thus, it is more for the human aspect rather than for the animals housed that the national parks are closed in seasons that make it difficult to access the national parks. The article further states that the tiger breeding is not the only issue associated with the opening of national parks all year round. A number of species do breed in the forest during the rainy months and together they maintain the ecological balance or the food chain that supports the apex species. Besides, Wildlife deserves a break from noise, light and other pollutions tourism brings to their habitat. Given the logistical challenges it poses, the rainy season is the most convenient period for providing the much needed respite. Now the question arises, should the national parks be opened all year round? The article says that while opening parks for tourism in the rainy months will not hamper the breeding prospects of the tiger, it may put a national animal at certain risks. Unlike the royal trophy hunters who avoid the dirty rainy months, the poachers consider monsoon as an appropriate opportunity when guards struggle to patrol much of the reserve. That is why even Project Tiger has always emphasized enhanced vigilance during the monsoon season. Here is a list of important national parks and tiger reserves which have been mentioned in the article. The Jim Corbett and the Rajaji National Park from Uttarakhand, the Ranthambore National Park in Rajasthan, Kaziranga in Assam, Bandhavgarh in Madhya Pradesh. Then we come to the Tiger Reserves, the Nagarhole and Bandipur of Karnataka, and the Kana Tiger Reserve of Madhya Pradesh. So that's all from my side for today. Do write your suggestions and queries in the comment section. Thank you so much.